if you don't consume at least 180 milligrams, you will slowly start losing magnesium in the body and you will eventually die of magnesium depletion. And the restriction studies are pretty clear about that. But that's for a healthy person who isn't insulin resistant and there's so many factors that will increase that. So 180 is your bottom line just to maintain balance. And high calcium, high phosphate, insulin resistance will slowly start, you know, right. the notches go up, right? right? And so we're only at around 250. That's not a huge gap from the absolute minimum. That's where people start getting themselves into trouble. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Department Podcast. I'm your host, Seem Land, and our guest today is Dr. James DeNicol Antonio. James is a cardiovascular researcher, scientist, and doctor of pharmacy. He's written or co authored over 200 publications in medical literature and is the associate editor of nutrition and British medical journal Open Heart. James was first on the podcast last year in episode 109, where we talked about his latest book, The Longevity Solution, with Dr. Jason Fung. But he's also written many other great books like The Salt Fix and Super Fuel. In this episode, we're going to focus on salt, why it's so misunderstood, why it's essential, and how to balance it with other electrolytes like magnesium and potassium. This episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers different at-home blood tests for various biomarkers like testosterone, thyroid, vitamin D, cholesterol, hormones and others. First, you collect the sample by using a finger prick, then you send it back and you can get the results within 2-5 to five days. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to your health and biology. You can get a 20% discount of all their blood tests with the code SEAMLUND at letsgetchecked.com. Use the code SEAMLUND for a 20% discount at letsgetchecked.com. I want to backtrack a little bit and uh, talk like why would, uh, why, why, why do people think that salt causes like uh, hypertension in the first place and uh, what, what, why is like associated with like negative uh, health outcomes? So it, salt kind of has a story similar to saturated fat. Um, so most people know about Ansel Keys with saturated fat and how he came up with, um, well, there was the seven country study, but prior to that was actually a six uh, country study. And he showed like with there, there were six countries and there was a linear line. If you, um, countries that had higher amounts of saturated fat intake had an increased risk of dying from coronary heart disease. But then when you added in all 23 countries, the line was more like this. So there was no association. Same thing with salt. So Lewis Dahl was sort of like the Ansel Keys for salt. And he did the same thing. He published a study with six countries showing that as salt intake increases, the risk of high blood pressure uh, increased. But then you had Interstall, which combined 48 countries. There was 52, and then they took out the indigenous populations that were consuming extremely low amounts. And there were, you were left with 48 populations that would more match our intake, anywhere from like 1,500 milligrams of sodium all the way up to 4,000. And the line was actually like this. Blood pressure actually went down slightly with a higher intake of sodium from around you know, 1,500 to 2,000 to 4,000, there was actually a line like this. Mm, wow. So um, again, extrapolating off of poor, you know, epidemiology back 40, 50 years ago was, was primarily the reason why. And, um, you know, that data was what was set forth to the 1977 Senate committee, as well as uh, Manili and, ba and Botterby's review paper was also presented in front of the Senate committee. And that convinced um, the, the uh, goals to add in low sodium for the entire population. Well, and uh, what's the situation right now uh, in terms of like, has the like, uh, blood pressure of the population decreased in response to this lower uh, sodium intake or has it Yeah, I mean, at, at, as you know, right, like the, our health is suffering like worse than ever. So, you know, a third of us have fatty liver disease, um, at least a third of adults have high blood pressure. Um, you know, two out of three people have insulin resistance, two out of three people have obesity. So obviously our health isn't better from 1977. It's much worse. And, you know, in the book, I kind of go over why it's sugar and not salt. And, you know, primarily if you have functioning kidneys, 
the kidneys, they will filter a full teaspoon of salt every five minutes. So oh. eating a teaspoon of salt is like a joke for the kidneys they're, <laughs> because they're filtering our salty blood constantly. So we filter um, around three to four pounds of salt every single day. Mm. And we are basically walking bags of salt water. We're like walking oceans. <laughs> and so we need to view salt as something that we use to cool off, um, that our kidneys uh, filter every single minute. Mm -hmm. And it's really not getting enough that's more dangerous than getting too much because, again, the kidneys will just release any salt that they don't need. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, insulin and insulin resistance. So, uh, how does that uh, fit into this uh, scheme? Yeah, so insulin resistance prevents uh, potassium and magnesium getting into the cell and reduces the sodium potassium ATPase. So when you're insulin resistant, you start accumulating sodium and calcium in the cell. You start retaining salt as well from the high insulin levels, which your kidneys, um, what ends up happening is when your insulin levels are high, the kidneys will retain more salt. So as you become more insulin resistant, your just your baseline insulin levels start increasing. So your baseline retention of salt is going to increase on its own. So what ends up happening is you become intracellularly deficient in magnesium and potassium. You start accumulating sodium in the cell and throughout the body when you're insulin resistant. When you fix that, you start improving your potassium magnesium status and you can start flushing out salt normally. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah, uh, part of the incident kind of makes you hold onto the water as well. And that's why like people, yeah. if they go on a, like a low carb diet, then they notice that they lose a bunch of water weight. And, uh, but the problem is that they also lose some of the sodium and uh, they may experience some uh, electrolyte imbalances as a result. Exactly. And, you know, typically, when we exercise, we lose about a half a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise through sweat. Hmm. Um, and there doesn't seem to be that much of a decrease with every hour of exercise. You, you sort of continually lose similar amounts of salt for even up to eight hours from the studies that I've looked at. Um, so, you know, if you're exercising just in kind of moderate temperatures, you're going to lose about a half a teaspoon of salt. But as the temperature increases, you can start losing anywhere from one to two t full teaspoons of salt. So 2,300 to 4,600 milligrams of sodium per hour of exercise. And in one study, it was in soccer players, uh, one, one of the uh, players lost 6,000 milligrams of sodium in one hour of uh, playing soccer in the heat. It was about 92 degrees out. So you can become very quickly depleted in salt, especially if you're exercising in the heat or going in a sauna. And as we know, both of those are very healthy for, um, for numerous reasons. Mm. So, it, you know, the, the guidelines never took that into account. They never took into, you know, America being basically addicted to caffeine and coffee as well, um, which we lose approximately a half a teaspoon of salt per four cups of coffee consumed. Hmm. So if you're drinking, if you're a coffee drinker, plus you're an avid exerciser, it makes absolutely no sense to go on a low salt diet. And from the balance studies that I've looked at, um, if you're exercising an hour per day, in order to be in magnesium and calcium balance, where you're not slowly becoming depleted in magnesium and calcium, you have to consume at least 5,000 milligrams of sodium for let's say like a 70 kilogram person and it would go up from there it's about 68 milligrams per kilogram of sodium that someone needs to consume to remain in magnesium balance if you're exercising an hour a day mm. and the reason for that is we because there had to have been a way in evolutionary times to conserve salt if we started becoming depleted because we can't just like go in an air conditioned house and slowly stop, like quickly stop sweating. Right. <laughs> and so the body will start using magnesium instead of sodium in, in uh, sweat to cool off. Hmm. And so with exercise, the reason why you need to maintain a certain amount of salt um, intake to remain in magnesium balance is because you slowly become depleted in sodium and the, the body's mechanism to maintain sodium levels is to pull them, pull it from bone. Mm. So we have a reservoir of sodium and magnesium in our bone. 
and about a third of magnesium in the bone is exchangeable, meaning we can pull it as a reservoir. And same thing with sodium. We have a, an amount of sodium in the bone that we can use as a reservoir when we become depleted. Right. So what ends up happening is the body starts pulling sodium to maintain a normal sodium level while we exercise so we don't become depleted. But the osteoclasts that are ripping apart the sodium from the bone, they're not smart enough to be like, well, I'm just going to grab sodium and I'm going to leave magnesium alone. It mm. pulls the magnesium as well. But the problem is, is you're not dropping magnesium in the blood uh, like you are sodium. So you're pulling sodium to maintain the normal, level, the normal level of sodium in the blood, but now you're spiking magnesium levels. And so the body thinks you're overloaded in magnesium. So it down-regulates magnesium absorption in the intestine. So you lose more in the feces and it starts kicking out more magnesium in the urine. So there's been at least a dozen balanced studies in people who exercise that if they're consuming one teaspoon of salt, it will lead to negative magnesium and calcium balance because calcium also gets pulled from the bone as well. So in order to prevent that, um, the balance studies show you need to consume around 5,000 milligrams of sodium. Wow, that's a really, really uh, like a vicious cycle in a way and a really fascinating in a way. Uh, so the sodium also acts like a buffer against becoming depleted of the other electrolytes and magnesium. Yes. Well, wow. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely really critical. And uh, I also like you, you. You know that um, too low sodium can also cause insulin resistance, which uh, exacerbates the entire problem in the first place. Correct. Yes. Um, so, so sodium controls the movement of amino acids. It controls the movement of almost every single neurotransmitter. It controls the movement of vitamin C. You can't drive vitamin C into any tissue without two, two sodium ions to bring in one ascorbic acid. Um, even to absorb vitamin C, sodium helps us do that. So when you, think of, when you think of it from that perspective, basically the whole system starts failing if you don't have enough so sodium in the body. And from the perspective of magnesium controlling potassium, uh, calcium in the body and salt controlling magnesium, really salt is the ultimate controller of all our electrolytes because it controls magnesium. And if you're not getting enough uh, uh, salt, the depletion of magnesium will also deplete the body of calcium and potassium. So it is this downstream cycle where salt is, sits at the very highest sort of tier and if it falters, magnesium, potassium, calcium fall with it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what would be like a minimal intake? Uh, you mentioned the 5,000 milligrams. Uh, like how, how, how would people like regulate their sodium intake on a daily basis? So, so 5,000 milligrams, um, well, one teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams. So 5,000 is around one and a half teaspoons of salt per day if you're exercising an hour per day. Now that is just to maintain a positive magnesium balance. If you're drinking coffee, let's say you drink four cups of coffee, you may need to add another half a teaspoon of salt to your intake. So it all really depends on your lifestyle, how much you're sweating, how often you use like a sauna, where you live, right? So if you're living in hotter climates, your salt intake should, should go up automatically. Um, and again, it comes down to, for most people, the, the message is not to, okay, I'm just going to start increasing my salt intake. For most people, it's like, I need to fix my insulin resistance and I need to start eating more high potassium and high magnesium foods, which that's where people get into trouble. They start just like increasing their salt intake and they forget the message that the, the three main things that I try to drive home, insulin resistance, magnesium, potassium, you have to fix those three first before you just start, you know, consuming more salt. Right. Yeah, because, uh, you know, consuming more salt, salt on top of like hypertension and insulin resistance can just make things worse or like you're just going to damage your health uh, as a result. Right, because your body is not um, handling the salt appropriately. It's yeah. over retaining it and it's accumulating it within the cell. Mm -hmm. So there's a diet is uh, more important initially. Exactly. Yeah. And what, I mean, what's interesting, we, we published a review paper and in that uh, review paper on magnesium, 
we had uh, referenced a paper that had shown that the, the average intake of magnesium in Paleolithic times was approximately 600 milligrams. And the average intake nowadays is less than half that, or around 250 milligrams. So if we evolved a uh, magnesium regulatory system at an intake of 600 milligrams, and now we're only consuming 250, then that's a problem. Particularly when you look at it from the point of, if you look at most studies, they'll say magnesium is required for 300 to 600 enzymes. That's just as a direct cofactor. That, that doesn't involve the entire metabolic processes, which references will typically show around 80% of all metabolic processes um, require magnesium. In my opinion, it's 100%, and, and here's why. Without magnesium, you cannot make protein, you cannot make DNA, you cannot create ATP, and you cannot activate ATP. I would love someone to explain to me how any metabolic function or process in the body would work without one of those four. It's just yeah. not going to happen. So yeah. even though it's only involved in, let's say, 600 enzymes directly as a cofactor, everything will falter without magnesium. And What's interesting is ATP does not activate until magnesium binds to it. It has to bind to it. Once it binds to it, it's, then it's activated. Mm. And so what's interesting is, right, our mitochondria help us make ATP. Magnesium is required for that to happen as well. It helps cytochrome C oxidase function, which is complex four in the electron transport chain. Um, and magnesium is required for glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, um, like I said, every metabolic function depends on it. So, you know, a lot of questions I get though is, you know, during evolutionary times, how did we get salt? Well, how did animals get salt? They would have trails and they would directly consume salt licks. Um, monkeys would eat certain trees, the trunks of the trees that were very high in salt. Parrots will fly miles and consume clay high in salt and bring it back to their children, they inherently know it's important for brain development. <laughs> Hence why we have salt receptors. It's so important, we literally have a taste receptor for it in our mouth. So um, again, salt intake, the reason why most people say to only consume like, I don't know, 500 to 1000 milligrams is because of the old papers that only looked at land consumption. They never looked at aquatic consumption. They only looked at um, land animal consumption and they never looked at interstitial fluid or blood or aquatic vegetation, which can be a thousand times higher in salt than land vegetation. And so that's why the, the estimates are, are much lower um, than they really should be because it never takes into account the direct intake of salt we would have consumed by literally just going to brackish water. Like we're not stupid. If we saw, if, if there was an ocean or there was brackish water or there was a salt lick, we would consume that directly. So we, we had direct access to salt always. Hmm. Whereas in, 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 through blood as well, direct access to salt and interstitial fluid and organs. Whereas with sugar, there's no just um, pit or pool of sugar that we could consume. You would always have to extract that sugar from you know you know the cane sugar or whatever and so we never would have access to pure crystalline sugar but we absolutely have had access to pure crystalline salt throughout our evolution mm, yeah yeah that definitely like uh, it's it's one of the most essential uh, nutrients that, that that we need and also like for uh, food preservation like uh, people people were able to just uh, get access to more calories for longer periods of time as well thanks to just salting their food yeah, I mean, we're so blessed to live like in a society and we're advanced now. We all have refrigerators. We forget back in 1930 and previously, we didn't have refrigerators. So for 10 to 20,000 years, we would use salt to literally preserve all our food. And our intake back in those times was anywhere from 20, the Romans consumed on average about 25 grams of salt. Um, in medieval times, they consumed around 40 grams. But upwards of um, you know, 100 grams of salt in, in areas like Norway and where they would you know, eat a lot of cod and would salt the cod, it could be as high as you know, 80 to 100 grams of salt per day. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Would, would like, uh, 
the salt requirement increase like if you are on like a somewhat of a low carb diet because like people in the like like you mentioned these regions these paleo people and uh, they didn't have like access to you know pastries and high muscle carbs so maybe they got away with a higher intake of salt as well yeah so when you so basic so glucose helps uh us absorb sodium and um it also helps drive sodium into the cell as well and also obviously when you're consuming more glucose your your insulin levels are higher so your kidneys can retain salt better so when you cut your salt or your carbohydrate intake you don't absorb salt as well um, you don't get salt into the cell as well uh, and you also lose more salt so there's sort of three mechanisms mm -hmm. and so you your requirement you know what's known as the keto flu at least for the first two weeks until your body can adjust uh, accordingly you you need an extra typically one to two thousand milligrams of sodium at least during that transitional period but then most people have told me that they function much better continuing that higher intake of sodium mm -hmm. and then i mean when you the thing is is when you go like let's say keto or you go on a low carb diet you're automatically cutting out processed food. And so you're automatically eliminating the salt. And since we're not consuming the whole animal anymore, we're not getting the salty blood and interstitial fluids. We're just consuming like a piece of chicken, right? With skin on it. Um, and sometimes not even the skin. You've lost the salt. So if you don't add it back, you can get yourself into trouble pretty quickly. And there's been the most common complaint I've gotten and people on a low salt diet is arrhythmias. And then when they slowly add back the salt, their arrhythmias go away, which may have something to do with either low sodium or potentially the low magnesium. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, like trying to, you're trying to actually prevent these uh, arrhythmias and uh, heart related issues by going on a low salt diet, but you actually may end up causing them or making them worse. Yep. That's yeah. true. Uh, what, but what about the quality of the salt? Like, I would imagine that the processed food industry that has kind of decreased the quality of the salt and it's not as good as it was in the past, or it's like missing the other minerals uh, like magnesium and that sort of thing. Yeah, you're, I mean, typically, even if you get a rock salt, it's not going to be um, super, super high in magnesium, except for uh, certain, there are certain salts in Australia that seem to have fairly high amounts of magnesium if you get it right from uh, ancient lakes. So, so there are some that do that actually can contain uh, in just 10 grams of salt, some salts can give you 180 milligrams of magnesium. Wow. So you definitely can get some, your typical rock salt is probably going to give you maybe 20 to 40 milligrams of magnesium per a day's worth of salt intake. So yeah, we did get some magnesium, but really it's the iodine um, that would come from rock salt. So uh, that's what's lacking as well. When you look at your typical table salt, it does not contain anything but sodium and chloride. Mm. Whereas uh, your your good, really quality salts contain uh, can contain up to five percent of other minerals. And, and again, that can equate to you know even a couple hundred milligrams of magnesium in certain salts. Well, yeah, definitely that will be quite substantial. Uh, so. Uh, you know, what are like the better salts out there than like uh, pink salt, rock salt, sea salt, uh, or what, what do you prefer? Yeah, so, so with sea salts, I used to inherently think that they would be high in iodine, but they're, most of them actually have virtually none. And, you know, oceans are uh, fairly polluted nowadays and do have microplastics. Um, when, you, when we talk about pink salt, we're referring to like Himalayan salt, uh, Redmond is another pink rock salt. And so th those are typically better because uh, typically these rock salts are hundreds of feet below the earth's surface. Uh, and the further you go, the further the, or the higher inability that water will be able to penetrate the, and the microplastics in that water will be able to penetrate into the salt. So those salts can have good amounts of iodine and we lose typically around 50 to 100 micrograms of iodine per hour of exercise through sweat. And so um, what's interesting is a lot of these metabolic balance studies for minerals back in the day, 
most of them typically only look at loss of minerals in the stool and in the urine. Very few ever also take into account mineral loss through sweat. And we actually lose quite a bit of minerals through sweat. The, fir the first one obviously being sodium and chloride is, is what we lose the most of. Uh, but after that, uh, iodine is up there as well. I mean, it, the RDA for iodine is 150 micrograms. So you can lose two thirds of that entire day's worth of intake in just an hour of exercise. Mm. And so you can get yourself in, in trouble pretty quickly. So if you're consuming one of those salts that has iodine in there, that'll help, you know, prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. The other minerals that we lose fair amounts of um, in sweat is primarily copper. Uh, and we do lose some zinc and iron as well, but, but from, a from a percentage of dietary intake, copper is probably the, the third most substantial mineral that is lost in our sweat. And we typically lose about 0.5 milligrams of copper per hour of exercise. Mm. And the RDA for copper is 0.9 milligrams. So you're losing over half your RDA for copper in just an hour of exercise. <laughs> so that, that one is, is a, a very big issue and it doesn't seem to go down as well like salt. So zinc and iron are different. You do start to lose fair amounts, but your body starts conserving it as you exercise more. But with salt and copper, it just keeps going and going and going. It doesn't really seem to drop. Wow. And I've seen studies showing that you can lose up to 1.5 um, grams of copper in, in like one hour at around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're in a sauna, you can, you can potentially rapidly become depleted in copper. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The sauna is also like tends to dehydrate you as well if you don't uh, properly get the uh, like uh, water as well as the electrolyte vaccine. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I, I misspoke. So 1.5 1. Um, milligrams of copper, you can lose it at temperatures of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or, hot, or higher. Hmm. And again, the, the RDA is 0. 0.9 milligrams. So you can almost lose double the amount of the RDA, let's say in an hour sauna se session, potentially. Uh, women seem to lose a little more copper than men. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Uh, would, would like uh, would you take some uh, salt or and other minerals before like either a sauna or an exercise or would you take them afterwards to recover i think um it's probably better to take it prior uh simply because you know you could potentially pass out if you don't hmm. <laughs> so ideally you would want to start an hour prior and slowly hydrate yourself for an hour. So the goal would be to probably consume a full teaspoon of salt over the period of an hour and probably about 20 ounces of fluid to help boost your blood volume. Mm -hmm. And then um, just make sure that your dietary intake of copper is fairly high because right. again, you can become pretty rapidly depleted. Hmm. Yeah, uh, what about uh, potassium then uh, you mentioned? that uh, we should aim for a high intake of potassium. Uh, so uh, what are some of the great sources for that? Yeah, so they're some of uh, my favorite foods, but they're not necessarily keto friendly <laughs> uh, foods. Some of them are, um, but so potassium, I think potatoes, I think beans, greens, uh, and tomatoes and fish too is fairly high in potassium. Hmm. So. Um, those are some of my, my dietary staples for maintaining. I mean, and some of those foods are fairly high in magnesium too, particularly spinach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like uh, the mainstream media tr tries to portray like banana as being the best source of potassium, <laughs> but uh, yeah. not, not really that great. I agree. Um, although if you consume green bananas, uh, you're, you're dramatically reducing the amount of uh, available starch and so I do think um, green bananas are a fairly uh, decent way to get uh, resistant starch without, but most people don't consume green bananas. Who's, who's walking around right. and eating a green banana? But if, if I'm doing it, it's almost barely tolerable. Like there's so much resistant starch, it sticks to my teeth. <laughs> so, the, 
So like, you know, there's, there's a huge difference between eating a, and even variations in green bananas, right? You can eat a green banana, it tastes pretty good. Or you can eat a green banana that is like a really full green banana. And it's, you're, after eating one of them, you're full because it is just like a fiber bomb. Right. Same thing with potatoes. Uh, how you cook a potato will dramatically determine its health effects. So it's not really about um, putting it in the refrigerator and, and boosting the resistant starch that way. That's on the margin. That doesn't get you that much. It's not overcooking the potato in the first place and leaving the resistant starch intact. Yeah. So when I, when I eat a potato, it's not like this amazing <laughs> like uh, you know sensation and the soft potato. It's a fairly hard potato. Yeah. So I think people kind of lose sight of the intricacies of you know the c- cooking methods when it comes to dietary carbohydrates and their health effects. Yeah, definitely. Like I do like to have some resistant starch, uh, like this, these foods that you mentioned every once in a while. And yeah, like the there's a huge difference between mashed potatoes and uh, like uh, <laughs> some hard hard po- or like soft boiled potatoes, especially e- even like for the glycemic uh, response. 100%. And then people forget too, I'm not just eating a bowl of potatoes. I'm, I'm consuming it with, you know, protein and a little yeah. bit of fat. And so the, the glycemic response is dramatically different. So now, now you're not having that big of a glycemic response, but you're having a satiety response. And you're also feeding yeah. your good gut bacteria as well. And you're producing, you know, short chain fatty acids. And people, I think it's funny when people try to argue that, um, you know, low carb diets, you can produce the same amount of short chain fatty acids or uh, similar, uh, like isobutyric on a carnivore diet versus butyrate. Mm-hmm. They're not the same. The, the, the level in regards to the, the log level is much higher when you're consuming resistant starch versus not with butyrate compared to isobutyric acid. And um, the other short chain fatty acids too are on a log scale much higher than you get on, let's say, a carnivore diet. Mm. Not to say that carnivore diets and um, low carb diets aren't healthy. I think I kind of go through cycles, right, of more of a carnivore, and then I'll eat more resistant starch and more higher carb foods, particularly if I'm working out. Yeah. But um, the 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 short chain fatty acids are, are definitely different on a plant-based versus a like carnivore diet and they and they can't be sort of similarly compared yeah yeah i totally agree and uh the body will like adapt to like any kind of diet especially the microbiome and uh, potentially like you wouldn't want to be like maybe in uh either of a diet like you wouldn't want to be in like a particular diet all the time you like the cyclical aspect like you mentioned is probably the where most of the benefits also come from and uh, kind of changes things up. Yeah. I mean, and most people's guts are so messed up. Most people have dysbiosis and that's why a lot of people can't tolerate um, resistant starch foods because you start feeding your, your bad gut bacteria. Hmm. And so the simplest thing to do is just to go on a carnivore diet, right? People are like, Oh my gosh, this carnivore diet is great. Well, yeah, you're not feeding your, your dysbiosis anymore. But in the long term, is that truly the optimal diet? I highly doubt it, just from a multiple nutrient uh, level intake. And from there's many other aspects as well. Phytic acid, which is a very potent anti-cancer molecule and combined free iron ions. Everybody hates on whole grains. But if you get true traditional whole grains, they're much different than um, whole, even whole grains nowadays. And there are definitely differences between, and there are unique properties of whole grains that you cannot get from virtually any other food source, like bioavailable ferulic acid, like the phytic acid that I had mentioned, um, like uh, beta cryptoxanthin, there's many other things too. And if you actually look at traditional whole grains, like a real traditional whole grain that's not refined, it's actually very, it's like a multivitamin. And I mean, I can send you how nutrient rich some of these really, if you're sourcing them from correct areas too, can be very high in things like magnesium and manganese. And it, a little bit of that can go a long way on a carnivore diet. Like one kiwi can go a long way on a mm-hmm. carnivore diet. Like I'm boosting someone's vitamin C. Right. So it's just yeah. interesting. Yeah, definitely. About. 
definitely. And the, the food quality plays a huge role. Uh, so, like you mentioned, that you know more magnesium in the food is also going to be you know better 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 for you. And uh, unfortunately, like the uh, mo- most conventional foods tend to be depleted from these uh, nutrients, especially magnesium. Yeah. Um... It's, I think the depletion is a lot worse than I had originally thought. So I had given a presentation about six months ago on the nutrient depletion in our food supply. And I looked at a, about a dozen studies, uh, you know, showing that, you know, since 1940, the amount of magnesium in our food has gone down by about 30%, uh, about 20% in meat and, and, and dairy, up to 30% in vegetables. If you go back even prior, though, to that, to like 1914, uh, the loss in magnesium may be as high as 80 to 90 percent. And so anywhere from, I would say, 30 percent to as high as eight times the amount of food you'd have to consume nowadays to reach the same level of magnesium that we did back 100 years ago. I know that's a huge variation, but we don't have great data going back a hundred years, right? And there's some problems with with the data itself. But you can imagine too that these uh, chemical fertilizers will also bind, like the the magnesium becomes bound to phosphate and it's less usable for the plant and the plants don't take it up as well. Hmm. And we grow for um, yield. So the plants are growing quicker. And so they're, they're growing fast and they have less time to take up nutrients. So they're more diluted. And then you have glyphosate, which can potentially reduce the ability of the plant to take up numerous minerals. So I do get a lot of questions like, can I just eat food and and be fine and get enough magnesium? I wish that were the case. We're no longer eating the food of 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, (laughs) that's kind of the sad uh, situation. (laughs) And um, like uh, most people are pretty deficient in uh, magnesium. And like you said, it's like one of the most important minerals and uh, nutrients for the body so uh, maybe like in the context of like uh, the uh, heart disease and hi- hypertension does magnesium have any like particular role in it the the simplest way that i can explain um explain magnesium's role in high blood pressure is that it's it's nature's uh, calcium channel blocker so what it does is it helps uh prevent the accumulation of calcium uh, in blood vessels. And so that helps, uh, magnesium helps to vasodilate our arteries and prevent vascular calcifications. Hmm. So you can see how atherosclerosis and high blood pressure can form when you're magnesium deficient because you are now calcium overloaded and sodium overloaded as well. Right. And uh, look, when you uh, have hypomagnesemia or low magnesium levels in the blood, that can precipitate arrhythmias, coronary vasospasms, sudden cardiac death. And um, just to maintain balance for a healthy person, uh, we used to think we needed around 300 milligrams, but that was based on balance studies. In order to know that the absolute lowest amount of a mineral you need, you have to do restriction studies. You have to slowly, they were just giving 300 milligrams and it was just maintaining people's balance. That's not how you do a minimal amount of a mineral study. You have to slowly drop the amount to a low level and then see where you start actually start losing that mineral. And so for magnesium, it's around 180 milligrams. If you don't consume at least 180 milligrams, you will slowly start losing magnesium in the body and you will eventually die of magnesium depletion. And the restriction studies are pretty clear about that. But that's for a healthy person who isn't insulin resistant, and there's so many factors that will increase that. So 180 is your bottom line just to maintain balance. And high calcium, high phosphate, insulin resistance will slowly start, you know, Raising. the notches go up, right? right? And so we're only at around 250. That's not a huge gap from the absolute minimum. That's where people start getting themselves into trouble. Yeah. They don't hit that amount. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it turns out like the we should have should have blamed like low magnesium instead of uh, the sodium so uh, as so, because magnesium also like causes the or like deficient magnesium causes stress on the body and uh, therefore kind of creates another vicious feedback for insulin resistance and hypertension yeah exactly and in regards to stress 
which I know, I know you were talking about your, your upcoming book and, and you're going into stress. So this might be uh, relevant to that is um, when you are stressed out, you release molecules like catecholamines and cortisol, right? That actually pushes magnesium out of the cell to deal with the stress, but then you end up losing it. So anxiety and stress are dealt with in the body by magnesium but then the body becomes flushed of it. So it's this vicious cycle of you get stressed, the body pushes out magnesium out of the cell, you lose it in the urine, and then magnesium deficiency itself causes a greater stress response during an event. Um, because you release more catecholamines and more cortisol when you're magnesium deficient. So there's a vicious cycle of magnesium deficiency causing um, stress and the stress causing more magnesium deficiency because activation of the sympathetic nervous system and noradrenaline will kick out magnesium in the urine. Mm. Yeah, like so, the more stressed out you are, the more magnesium you also need. And uh, yeah, magnesium. And I, hate, I honestly hate when people say that too, though, without supporting references. Like everyone's like, yeah, when you're stressed out, you need more magnesium. Well, <laughs> show me the actual clinical studies that actually shows that. And so in, in my review paper, subclinical magnesium deficiency as a leading cause of cardiovascular death and public health crisis, I, had, I made sure to insert references that actually show that when you have an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, you lose more magnesium in the urine. It's not just some like myth that people keep saying. It's right. very true. Hmm. Um, and speaking of stress, Every, like if you go to a doctor and you say you're stressed or you say you're depressed, they just, just didn't give you an antidepressant, right? To like mm -hmm. boost serotonin, like a selective uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like Celexa or sertraline, which is Zoloft. Um, or they'll give you a serotonin noradrenaline or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, right? To boost serotonin and to boost noradrenaline in the brain, which are neurotransmitters in the brain, right? Which help with, uh, you know, depression and stress. Serotonin is formed from tryptophan. Tryptophan forms a uh, 5-hydroxytryptophan, 5-HTP, eventually forms serotonin. Uh, the pathway, uh, there's another pathway where uh, dopamine forms noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Magnesium is required in both pathways in multiple steps in order to form serotonin, and serotonin eventually forms melatonin, and the steps in between require magnesium. So you do not form serotonin and you do not form melatonin, which helps you sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not sleeping, you're gonna be stressed out and your mood's not gonna be good. And you do not form dopamine and you do not form noradrenaline without magnesium. Mm -hmm. And again, dopamine and norepinephrine or noradrenaline, you know, synonymous with each other, are important neurotransmitters in the brain. And you'd think doctors would understand this if they're treating depression. Like what are the main neurotransmitters actually? How do they form? Like what is what minerals and vitamins are required to even form these? Instead of just giving them a pill, they don't even think to look at diet and nutrition and what's required to even form those neurotransmitters. Yeah. Not to mention their release is, you know, somewhat dependent on magnesium as well in the brain. And magnesium in the brain is what controls our uh, synapse uh, density, function, and plasticity. Because mm. magnesium in the brain is what increases NR2B and MDA receptors in the brain. And so patients with depression have been shown to have lower brain levels of magnesium, lower cerebral spinal fluid levels of magnesium, and same with Alzheimer's patients. They have been shown to have lower brain levels of magnesium. Wow. And, you know, that can... Obviously, if you don't have enough magnesium, the synapses, you're gonna, your loss of synapses are going to increase, and that's how neurons communicate with each other, so you're going to have cognitive decline, and then you're not going to be able to form those neurotransmitters, so you're going to have anxiety and depressed mood um, and an increased stress response. So magnesium is very important in the brain. And, you know, I've been mentioning magnesium L3 and 8 a lot uh, because it's really one of the only magnesiums that can actually boost uh, brain magnesium levels. It's very difficult to increase magnesium levels in the brain. So even if you give IV magnesium and you boost blood levels 300%, you're only going to boost brain or cerebrospinal magnesium levels by 15 to 20%. Um, 
And the reason why three and eight works so well is it brings magnesium into the cell through glute transporters. So mm. it'll bring it mm. into the cerebrospinal fluid and then it'll bring it into brain neurons through glute transporters. And I was kind of racking my brain. Well, from an evolutionary perspective, why would we need magnesium three and eight? Like, why is this substance so beneficial? Well, three and eight is actually formed from vitamin C. As vitamin C gets oxidized mm. to dehydrovitamin C, it forms three and eight. Now, if you think about like the 30 million years of primate evolution, where our systems are built off of, nowadays, uh, gorillas consume around 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C. Uh, monkeys that are about one-tenth our size consume around 700 milligrams of vitamin C. So from a 30 million year primate evolution for a primate, let's say our size, you're looking at anywhere from 3,000 to 7,000 milligrams of vitamin C that would have been consumed on a daily basis. And so we would have had a ton of three and eight formed from our high vitamin C intake. Mm -hmm. But we have a three and eight deficiency in the brain, not just from a nowadays not eating a lot of vitamin C, but how we get vitamin C into the brain is reduced through uh, low sodium levels, which 6 million Americans have every year, and through high sugar levels. So high amounts of glucose will prevent DHA getting into the brain, which is the oxidized form of vitamin C, dehydroasorbic acid, and low sodium levels will reduce the amount of ascorbic acid, which is the active form of vitamin C, getting into the brain. So now you have a drop in vitamin C and oxidized vitamin C in the brain. So you have a drop in three and eight. So that's why we can't bring magnesium into the brain as well, because our brains are deficient in vitamin C. Wow. Wow. That's a really, really fascinating uh, story. And uh, definitely like it comes to show uh, how interconnected all these things are, like uh, the stress kind of depleting uh, your magnesium and also like uh, you, you you need vitamin C for dealing with stress and so on so and that's a really crazy crazy way to think about yeah like the, the these things are so evolved over the course of so many like millions of years and uh, still affect, affect us uh, in the modern world yeah I mean vitamin in those pathways I was talking about forming those neurotransmitters vitamin C is a part of many of those pathways as well and there's a reason for it and it's because we used to consume a lot of it Hmm. And I've had discussions with uh, Paul Saladino on how we would get vitamin C from an from a animal-based diet. Now, uh, if you take the most extreme example, like the Arctic Inuit, if they were to catch a whale, like a 50,000-pound whale, that would feed the entire village and their dogs for eight months. And uh, muktuk, which is whale skin, is very high in vitamin C. Hmm. And if they were to catch and, and kill a whale, they would have over 200 milligrams of vitamin C per day for eight months straight, just from the whale skin. Wow. Now, the Inuit were very smart too. They would store berries in seal fat for the winter. So they had access to berries year round. Wanna be clear about that. They also froze vegetation. So they had access to vegetables year round. They would also harvest in the dead of winter seaweed that is very high in vitamin C in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So they had access to vitamin C year round, not just through animal foods, but also through plant foods. So again, I think that our intake of 60 to 90 milligrams is being like adequate is so far away from what it should be. And that's why I think there's this deficiency in three and eight in the brain because we're not getting a lot of vitamin C. Not mm -hmm. to mention, we used to stress animals out before we killed them. We would hunt them for hours. Animals can produce up to 10 times the amount of vitamin C when they're exercising and stressed out. Yeah. So now we're consuming like meat that's been hung for two weeks. Whereas if you were to consume like fresh organs and, and the blood after a kill, it's going to be very, very high in vitamin C from the animal just producing more vitamin C. And we would kill and you know, and, and start consuming that animal sometimes right away for the fluids and for the organs. And then, yes, we would um, also uh, consume up to two weeks an animal. But our baseline now, we start at two weeks. We hang meat for two weeks, and the supermarket meat that we're getting is already two weeks old, whereas that's about the maximum we would have consumed meat for is about two weeks. Hmm. 
So yeah. you see how it's different. You see how the vitamin C would have been much higher from just mm -hmm. hunting a stressed out animal and consuming it somewhat more fresher or within yeah. a few days versus, you know, weeks. Yeah, definitely. Like that's a, that's a really important point. And, uh, uh, the, animals do produce naturally vitamin C, but humans don't. So when we do eat the animals after, after chasing them, then we, we would still get like plenty of vitamin C from the kill. Uh, but yeah, like yeah. in the modern world, we don't, uh, we don't like uh, hunt uh, and we don't uh, like kill fresh or we don't consume fresh uh, meat. Exactly. And I mean, your typical organ is, is going to contain around 30 milligrams of vitamin C per three and a half ounces. So if you're just consuming a pound of organs, you're going to get about 150 milligrams of vitamin C just from that, not counting vitamin C circulating in the blood or fluids. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid is very high in vitamin C. And most uh, interstitial fluids and, and fluids in the animal is very high in vitamin C as well, which we're not getting. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting to think about the low intakes of vitamin C nowadays and potentially leading to um, the three and eight deficiency, which is leading to magnesium deficiency in the brain, which can lead to anxiety, depression, uh, and reduction in cognition. Mm. Yeah. So uh, how would you go about preventing that? <laughs> like what's, what's some uh, like aims people should aim for? Uh, so number one would be to boost dietary vitamin C intake. The problem again is, there's been this nutrient depletion in our food. And when I was going through a lot of the studies as well, vitamin C is no different. We've lost about 30% of the vitamin C since 1940. And prior to that, it's probably more like 80%. So our food is now much more depleted in vitamin C than it used to be. So, you know, yes, diet, of course, number one. Um, but, you know, in certain instances, you may need supplementation and uh, you may need uh, other things as well. Like I take magnesium three and eight, a thousand milligrams twice a day. And again, that's, that's because our food is depleted in magnesium. And I know that I'm going to have to eat at least, you know, 30 to 40% more of the food than I would have a hundred years ago. And I don't want that added extra calories and uh, fat and things like that. Right. So I'd rather just take a supplement and boost my levels by another couple. It's like 144 milligrams of elemental magnesium and 2000 milligrams of magnesium L3 and eight. And people tend to overdose magnesium. So like how we would get magnesium and vitamin C is more of a constant flow throughout the, throughout the uh, day. And so you don't want to like take 400 milligrams of magnesium, elemental magnesium all at once because it'll spike your, your blood magnesium levels and you won't absorb it as well. And it may, it could potentially even induce magnesium deficiency, especially if it has a laxative effect. So mm. uh, low doses over a prolonged period of time. I also drink uh, Gerald Steiner, which has a hundred milligrams of magnesium uh, per liter. And I'll, I'll slowly sip that throughout the day as well. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's good, good advice in a way. You you mentioned uh, the L three and eight, so I heard you were working on some sort of a supplement for that. Yeah, so L three and eight, um, really the 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 patented form is called Magtine, and uh, the uh, supplement that was tested in Alzheimer's patients actually com combined uh, Magtine, which is again a patented form of magnesium L three and eight. Uh, with vitamin C and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And that uh, study um, where they used uh, an extended form of magnesium L3 and 8 showed an improvement in MMSE score of about 1.6, which uh, in, in two months. And these patients' MMSE score went from 23.3 at baseline uh, to almost 25. And 24 is considered cognitive impairment. So these patients were technically no longer considered, um, considered to have cognitive impairment. And even after four months of stopping uh, magnesium L3 and 8, they were, their MMSC score was still above 24. So there was like this long lasting effect. It did slowly start going down, but it was interesting to see um, such a dramatic improvement in, in that patient population. There's three clinicals with magnesium L3 and 8. That, um, that was one of them, but it's also been tested in healthy people and in people with cognitive impairment. And in those who are 50 to 70 years old with cognitive impairment, that was the patient population selected. 
uh, it reversed brain aging by nine years on average. And some people had a 40 year reversal in brain aging. Again, because you can literally grow more synapses when you boost uh, magnesium level in the brain. And compared to like magnesium glycinate or chloride or malate or gluconate, none of those boost brain levels of magnesium. Um, only magnesium three and eight does that. So that's why I, I take that formulation. Hmm. And but but would other forms of magnesium be uh, beneficial for like other processes in the body? I don't know, like stress management or sleep or something. Yeah, if it's not causing a laxative effect, which most people take magnesium citrate, but citrate is more for um, inducing a laxative effect. So mm. that, in my opinion, that's more of an inappropriate uh, magnesium to take. Mm-hmm. Uh, magnesium uh, glycinate seems to have a little bit less laxative effect, but same with three and eight. Three and eight um, actually seems to have la- one of the lowest laxative effects. Um, and it seems to be very good at driving magnesium into the cell, which is important too. Yeah. So glycinate has good bioavailability, but we're not 100% sure how good it boosts cellular magnesium. So there's, there's, there's three factors when it comes to a magnesium supplement. Does it cause a laxative effect? If it does, even if it's quote unquote highly bioavailable, you're flushing out the magnesium. So for example, magnesium oxide has a ton of elemental magnesium, but it can cause magnesium deficiency because it does have a laxative effect. Mm -hmm. The second uh, property that you wanna look for in a magnesium supplement is bioavailability, of course. But if it can't dissociate into magnesium ions and get into the cell well, then that's a problem. And so, you know, that's, I know for a fact, the studies show that magnesium L3 and A boosts uh, red blood cell and brain levels very well. Um, Glycinate may or may not. I know it has good quote unquote bioavailability. I'm not sure how good it is at getting it into the cell. So I I just don't chance it. Okay. Okay. Uh, But uh, like most people would also take their magnesium in the evening uh, to kind of wind down. Like, is there any circadian aspect to it or is there any better times to take it? I think inherently there probably is. Um, because if you, if you think of like glycine, right, they, they use glycine at about three grams prior to bedtime to help with sleep. I think though, if you're acutely deficient, I think more importantly is to just slowly boost your levels up to a normal level so that now you can form melatonin correctly and, and synthesize it correctly. And once you do that, your sleep's going to be better just from fixing the deficiency. Mm. Yeah. I don't think that we need to stress that magnesium needs to be taken at bedtime. You need to have adequate amounts so you can synthesize serotonin and then form melatonin from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, it's uh, yeah, like if you are already deficient, then uh, taking it at the, like a specific time could help in the short term, but it's not going to be like a, a long term uh, solution. So this solution solution would be to uh, overcome the deficiency in the first place. Yep, exactly. Uh, what about foods? Are there any particular foods that also have a higher, higher uh, amounts of uh, magnesium? So, whole unrefined grains, beans, uh, greens. So chlorophyll has a magnesium at the center of its structure. Uh, fish is pretty high in magnesium too, uh, and shellfish. Um, Meat is an okay source. Not there's not a whole lot, and then eggs and dairy don't have a lot of magnesium. So um, it's sort of again why I consume about half my calories from plant foods and half from animal foods is because uh, plants are higher in uh, mag- manganese, magnesium, um, calcium, and then animal foods are great sources, right, of B12. Um, uh, B2, riboflavin, so, um, you know, K2. I mm. think there, there probably is an optimal diet. It's going to differ for every person. I, uh, I think there's a small subset where the optimal diet is 100% carnivore and a small subset where you're 100% vegan. And I think a lot of people will land um, clo- closer to like a carnivore-ish 
or in the middle where it's sort of like me, I'm about middle way where 50% of my calories are from plants and 50% are from animal foods. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, it's more of a, more of like a bell curve type of thing that uh, on the, on one end of the, on the, one end of the spectrum, you have the extremes, but the extremes are like a small proportion and the majority of people are some like a, some form of like a balanced way of eating. Yeah, I think animal foods are a little bit more important today because our foods are so deficient in vitamins and minerals. And now animal foods are not an exception, but plant foods have been affected more than animal foods. So yeah. I think it's very, very difficult to have optimal health for a long period of time on a vegan diet nowadays because you, the food will never be the same. You can get close with biodynamic farming and things like that, but even the pollution, even the heavy metals reduce the absorption of vitamins and minerals, and we're never escaping that. Yeah. Um, so I do think at a certain extent, you should have at least 10% of your calories coming from animal foods. Yeah, yeah, it's a, like a simple fix. The same with like eating a kiwi on a carnivore diet. <laughs> you can achieve yeah. so much with just eating like one <laughs> single egg yolk. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's been great uh, talking with you. Like, are you writing another book uh, by any chance? Uh, yeah. So I have um, a couple, you know, books that have that are sort of basically already written. Uh, but with this whole, you know, coronavirus craziness, you know, everything's sort of on hold at this point. But I'm sure there might be a couple books in the in the future that I that I put out. Yeah, looking forward to it, and we're going to put all the links in the show notes as well. And uh, my before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Uh, so, uh, Dr. James Denick on Instagram, um, and drjamesdenick.com is my website. Um, and so, also on Facebook, Dr. James Denickel Antonio and Twitter as well, uh, Dr. James Denek. Awesome. And uh, my last question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, I think it was a habit that I used to do when I was younger and then sort of stopped doing, and that's, that's resistance training. And I think even if you have a good diet, you will not be able to utilize your vitamins and minerals if you are not insulin sensitive. And we slowly lose muscle as we age. So I think that one of the best pieces of advice is pick up some weights and build some muscle and build better insulin sensitivity because that's going to allow your nutrients to work better in the, in the, uh, in your body. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so true. And also like the foods that you do eat would be also, uh, like the calories themselves would be proportioned better like you would be having better body composition and uh, less fat mass so you would be just using the food that you have you know like a healthier way exactly so now like our food is now higher in right protein fat in in carbs and diluted so exercise will sort of subtract the extra calories that you need to get the same nutrition as before and so i think exercising now is more vital than ever which means salt and iodine that you lose and sweat through exercise is more vital than ever. Mm. So I think combining good nutrition with good exercise and, you know, things like sauna therapy as well is important. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, it's uh, always great talking with you and uh, let's stay tuned for the next, next episode in the future when you're coming up with your next book. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah, you too.